ध्यायामोधवलावंधनवती तेजोमयी नैष्टिके स्निग्धा पांगविलोकिनी भगवती मंदस्मित श्रीमुखी वात्सल्यामृतवर्षिणी सुमधुर संगीर्तनारापिनी श्यामांगी मधुसिक्तसूक्त अमृतानंदात्मिका ईश्वरी ओम अमृतेश्वरी नम ओम अमृतेश्वरी नम ओम अमृतेश्वरी So once again, welcome back, everyone. Over to you, sir. Okay. Uh, so uh, today, uh, because uh, now we are uh, like uh, <clears throat> uh, like going through the the final chapters of the uh, the book, the uh, Rivers of Rigveda, and also going through the uh, some of the uh, very rare rivers. Uh, most of these rivers are. Found uh, only reference, only one reference in the Rigveda, and uh, most of them are also part of the Sindhu River network. Uh, so uh, Sindhu has a uh, Sindhu River is uh, having a lot of tributaries, and uh, some of the <coughs> tributaries in the plains we have seen them. Uh, one of the, the one of the main tributaries is the Kubha River or the Kabul River, which is. Uh, an access gateway into Afghanistan. So the the Rigvedic Rishis, they have uh, started uh, mentioning the Kupha River starting from the uh, fifth mandala onwards. Somewhere in the middle Rigvedic period, uh, you get the mentions, and uh, we, that also means that uh, somewhere somewhere around the middle Rigvedic period onwards, we have uh, uh, the Rigvedic Rishis started crossing the Sindhu River. Which was a boundary river. We we saw it in yesterday. Uh, Sindhu River was a boundary river for the early Rigvedic people, and its uh, northern course was known as Rasa. So they have crossed that boundary river, Sindhu, and also explored the western tributaries of Sindhu River. And the largest one of them was the uh, this uh, Kupha River or Kabul River, which uh, helped the Rigvedic people to explore or migrate or settle. To eastern Afghanistan, almost the areas uh, which are watered by the Kupha River, the eastern Afghanistan, some plan plains. Uh, Afghanistan is otherwise a mountainous country. The only plain plains uh, available in Afghanistan is on the banks of the Kupha River, and the Kabul city was uh, grown out of the Kupha River, and it also shares the name of the river. So that's a uh, Another Rigvedic feature where the city which is growing, which is grown from a river, like a child grown from a mother's umbilical, uh, like a cord. So like that, the cities are born, both share the same name, the Kupha River and the Kupha city. And that uh, became Kabul River and the Kabul city. So that's uh, all the things we have uh, mentioned in our previous talks. And then there are other rivers which are flowing in the plains. Uh, like uh, Kuram River, that is Kuramu, and uh, Mahatnu, a river which uh, was flowing earlier but now disappeared, and then Gomati, which is known as Goma. So, those rivers we were uh, familiar with. And then came <coughs> uh, some other rivers, uh, like which are like into mostly into the mountainous regions. Uh, so, the, there are like, uh, for example, one river we have. Uh, the, I mean, I am talking about the tributaries of Sindhu, which is in the mountainous region, the Anitapa River. That is a Pondia River, uh, like uh, currently known as Pondia River. It's slightly uh, into the mountains, and we noted the river as joining the Sindhu, ri Sindhu River and uh, at uh, rectangles, uh, like when the Sindhu was flowing, uh, the river Sindhu was flowing uh, in as an east to, to west river along uh, across the mountains, and it suddenly uh, turned right angles. Uh, and going to the north to south river. At that corner, the, the Sanitabha comes and join it. Currently, it is known as the Pondia, Pondia River, like that, the current name of the river. So that is somewhat in a mount, it's a mountain river, somewhat into the mountains, higher in the uh, higher in the mountains. So that river we have found. 
uh, and uh, uh, so we have uh, like uh, one of the mountain river we are familiar that is the 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 Anitapha river and then uh, like uh, there is single single mentioned rivers the rivers which are mentioned only once uh, that is the, those rivers are typically uh, the rivers of sindhu which is uh, in the upper course the upper course of the river so again the name rasa will be appearing in this in these references because the uh, sindhu is known as rasa in the upper courses so uh, th those are the rivers that we are going to discuss today uh, so these are the like uh, this is the Sindhu River upper course of the Sindhu River and it is known as Rasa uh, in in the upper course so that we have seen yes, uh, in yesterday's class and you, this is the Kupha River which is the largest tributary of Sindhu going into the Afghanistan so uh, that river we have already seen and then this is the Anitapha I mentioned uh, the Anitapha River the Kupha River is this one and that is the uh, the northernmost uh, tributary of Sindhu which is in the plains so this is the along the this uh, Charasada valley that is, this is the Charasada valley where the Gandhara, Gandhara uh, Janapada or the Gandharva territory exists so that so it pa passed through this uh, Gandharva territory that is the, the Kabul river is passing through that territory and then joining Sindhu in the plains again this is also a plain and then uh, you move upwards and the river is known as Rasa and the Anitapha comes and joins it, the, the Kondia River here, joins uh, exactly at the right spot where the Sindhu River, it is a uh, east to west flowing river up to here. And uh, the, the point from the point onwards uh, where Anitapha is joining it, the river is moving in the north to south direction. So this is a southern, southward course of the river and it goes to the plains. And when it reaches here, the first the Kupha River is joining from the left, the western side. And Sarayu River is joining from the eastern side, and then goes further down. And you see other rivers like the uh, uh, Kuram, that is Kurumu River and uh, Gomati, uh, all these rivers join it in the plains. And then it descends into uh, slowly uh, merges into the ocean, Arabic, uh, Arabic, uh, Arabian Sea. So that is the entire course of the river Sindhu. And uh, today uh, we are actually seeing three more three tributaries of Sindhu. Uh, not three, but even more also I will talk about. So one is the Swetia River. This is the Swetia River. And uh, Swetia basically is now uh, currently, uh, it is uh, known as the Gilgit. The river name, current river name is the Gilgit River. Of course, it is passing through the Gilgit city here. So this is our Gilgit River is a today's name. And it is uh, uh, basically a Kunsa, uh, like uh, the, uh, this is this particular area. Anybody familiar with the Kashmir, uh, uh, the Jammu and Kashmir's uh, map uh, or the the shape of Jammu and Kashmir? This is this all falls into the currently falls into the park park occupied uh, Kashmir. Of course, uh, currently there is a lot of conflict going on in in this uh, where to to make it part of India after they lost all the trust on the Pakistan. So they, they even the people want to join uh, India. So this is the area. Uh, so this is after the Sindhus in the upper course of Sindhu. This is one of the largest river, the Swetia River. So in Rigveda, it is uh, attested by two names. One name is Swetia, another one is Swetayavari. Both, the, both are the two names of the same river. And it is currently known as the Gilgit River. Uh, and it is again flowing through the frozen territory of the Himalayas in the snow covered mountains. So that uh, the river is flowing like this. And of course, the river is also known as Ras the, the main river, the, the Sindhu river is also known as Rasa again. So this uh, all this uh, in all these areas, the river, uh, the Sindhu river is known as Rasa river. And after it goes here, uh, one more river comes and joins it, that is Sushartu. Uh, in Rigveda records it as Sushartu river. Today it is known as Singar. Sing, the name of the river is Singar. And then it moves slightly and then one more river comes and joins Sindhu. That is the Tritsama. And uh, today it is known as Shok, Shok river. So these are the three rivers. So basically these three rivers are the uh, northern tributaries because now the, the river direction is from east to west. So uh, whatever left-hand side rivers are the northern rivers. 
so these rivers flow originate in the northern uh, himalayas karakoram range and uh, then slowly uh, like the flow southwards and joins the three rivers are joining so one is the swetia then shushartu and trisama so three rivers join from the northern side or the left hand side uh, which i mean the okay if we're going with the flow of the river in this direction then it is on the right hand side so left and right is not very good uh, for defining the river better we call it northern rivers so, so the rivers are joining from the north and uh, i mean yeah coming flowing from the north and joining the sindhu river so these three rivers are the uh, upper tributaries or the himalayan tributaries some of, some of the main himalayan tributaries of sindhu so these rivers are also mentioned very rarely i mean said for example the nadi sukta this is a, this is a rich or a verse in the nadi sukta so nadi sukta is a 10.75 that is uh, 10th mandala 75th sukta so in that sixth rich or sixth verse uh, sixth stanza mentions these three rivers like trishtamaya prathamam yathave saju shushwartuva rasaya shwetya atya like that so the word rasa is uh, here actually if you see there is no dirga here so it is a word play by the rishi the the, uh, the rasa is implied here rasa river is implied here but uh, the rishi is using rasaya means uh, pleasurable i mean it is actually even though it is indirectly implying the river rasa that is uh, the other name of sindhu they are using a word play here so that it can be also mean rasaya means like a verb it is being used like uh, rasa means uh, joyfully interestingly joyfully etc rasa that kind of names will come that kind of connotations will be there and this is a typical uh, like the sindhu kshit priyametha is the composer of the sukta so they use all these kind of word plays like uh, sometimes they in, in in case of bibali river we have seen it where it uh, mentioned vitasthanam vitasthanam actually is not a noun it, it is a verb actually uh, which means uh, uh, a river got shifted its uh, it shifted its course but we know that the 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 author of the sutta is giving an implied i mean implied or a hidden meaning to the reader that vibali subsequently become vitastha so the same river is uh, uh, the older course of the river is vibali and it's a, it's a transformed course is called vitastha so that meaning also is cryptically encoded into the uh, the stanza so that word play we have seen before where it talks about vibali and vitastha so vibali is directly mentioned as the river name but vitasthanam is actually means having shifted its course it's a verb actually it's not a noun but inside the verb they have given the name of the river that means vibali vibali uh, river changed its course and subsequent course of the river is known as vitastha that meaning is hidden hidden meaning is encoded into the stanza itself so that the rishi is saying okay vipal sindham vibalyam vitasthanam like that 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 uh, uh, that particular verse or stanza is uh, going like that so this is another word play where it the word rasa is encoded even though as it's a verb uh, the word is encoded into the uh, stanza so that uh, the geographic this is a kind of a geographical encoding of the information so that trishama and shushartu and shwetia these three rivers are actually flowing into the rasa river rasa is nothing but sindhu river so that is what it is uh, showing and the second stanza you can see sind tvam sindho gobhaya gomatim prumum mahatno as charatam yabir ise here actually the other tributaries of the the out of one after it passed uh, into the plains then you have kupha gomati prumu mahatno saratham there is like uh, whatever rivers we have seen yesterday where it mentioned about kupha river that is this river and then gomati is mentioned and gomati is actually comes a little later than prumu and mahatma and the meaning of the uh, stanza is like gomati is bringing prumu and mahatma saratham like saratham means along in the same chariot so uh, the rishi is imagining that gomati is traveling along with prumu and mahatma in the same chariot 
and coming in to join the Sindhu River. Basically, what it means is that Kromu and Grom, Mahatnu were the became the tributary of Gomati, and Gomati is bringing these three two rivers into Upha. So that we have seen yesterday. So we can see this single stanza. This many rivers geography is important. Uh, if you are, if any people have any confusion, maybe I'll just take that. Uh, this yeah, here it is. What this is, but that Saratham is basically this one. Like uh, this is a tenth mandala. This is a situation which is uh, she is mentioning. Gomati is traveling in the same chariot uh, along with the Mahatnu and Krumu. So Krumu and Mahatnu are coming and joining with Gomati, and Gomati is traveling with uh, Krumu and Mahatnu, Mah Krumu and Mahatnu in the same chariot, and then joining him. So that kind of encoding is what you can see here. Yesterday we I I, I didn't see the verse, so this uh, so the verse you can see that is how it has been encoded. Here. So the exact uh, river sequence is completely encoded into this the second part of the. Uh, Okay, this is B basically the second part of the uh, that uh, stands up. So you have this many number of rivers encoded. So yesterday we have seen this last line, and today actually our focus is on the first line where it mentioned Tritsama and then uh, Shushartua, Rasa, and Svetya, like that. And Rasa, uh, you know, some you can also interpret it as a tributary, but uh, since uh, we already know Rasa here is uh, directly implying uh, the river Sindhu itself. So, uh, but definitely, like you can see, uh, like if you if you look if you look at that, this entire stretch of the river Sindhu is Rasa. So uh, you can uh, consider like uh, it is talking about Shvetia and Susharatu and Tratsama, and then uh, all of them are flowing into the Rasa River, and then it's flowing like this. Even uh, like uh, see the, the upper course of the river Rasa uh, can also be considered as uh, kind of it's not exactly tributary but considered as uh, part of the Sindhu river itself. Uh, so all that entire river uh, dynamics is completely captured in the first line. And the, these are the kind of uh, rivers that we get. And uh, of course the current names I repeat again. So Shvetya is the Shvetvaya. Shwet both are the same name. Same name of the Gilgit River in Rigveda, and uh, Shushartu is the Singa River, the second uh, second river in the northern side, and Tritsama, the Shok Shok River. So three rivers in the northern side comes and joining the Sindhu in this particular uh, region. Those so those tributaries are mentioned in the uh, this particular or uh, ten seventy five six. They are mentioned. And of course, uh, Shvetia means a white white river. That we, anyway, it's it's not very complicated basically because the river is completely snow covered. So the river because it's a, if among all the rivers, it is the northernmost river actually. It's completely a snowy uh, white river basically. So even the the valleys of the river will be snow covered. So it will all look like a completely a white colored river. So that is the meaning in that that meaning is automatically implied in the river name Svetia River. And Susharthu uh, means a fast flowing river, and Tratsama is a okay, Susharthu is a uh, curvy river, and Tratsama is a fast flowing river. So that kind of uh, terminal names names also indicate some kind of attribute of the river, like curvy uh, going, uh, river going in curves and uh, the river moving uh, fast moving river. So some kind of meanings also come with the the etymology of the river. Uh, that's also very much interesting. So, uh, what basically happens is that the Sindhukshik Priyametha is, I think, a geographer uh, par excellence, uh, the Rishi of the Rigveda. And I also mentioned before, 20, around 21 rivers are uh, mentioned in a single Sukta, that is Nadi Sukta. And he is the author of that uh, Sukta, that is the uh, uh, 75th uh, Sukta of the 10th Mandala. So these are the uh, some of the three rivers that is mentioned in the Nadi Sukta, and these uh, rivers are not mentioned anywhere. It is only found in the Nadi Sukta. <clears throat> so one reason is because the plan plains are more uh, the plain planar uh, the that is Indus plain is the where the things happens a lot, uh, and people rarely climb up to the mountains to the Himalayas. So only probably a geographer who traced the river Sindhu will be interested in these rivers. So that is why these rivers are not mentioned in other parts of the Rigveda. 
of course shweta shwetia river is mentioned as shweta yavari in uh, uh, like fourth mandala ones Other, otherwise these three rivers are not mentioned anywhere and they are confined to the nadi sukta alone uh, so this is all about the three rivers pratsama susharthu and shwetia uh, for example not much events are there along associated with these rivers uh and they are just mentioned just enumerated or just listed as some uh three rivers which are uh, tributaries of sindhu and the, not much information is available in the rigveda uh, there are no like like the activities of kings or devatas or rishis as uh, passing through or none of these are mentioned about this these three uh, rivers Uh, only because Shwetia have an another name Shwetayavari and that Shwetayavari Shwetayavari is mentioned in the fourth mandala, so it got it got at two two references. Whereas Shusharthu and Tatsama, Shusharthu and Tatsama are just single isolated rivers mentioned and no other ones. Completely confined to the Nadi Sukta only this particular. This is this is the only reference Tatsama Shusharthu in the uh, tenth mandala, seventy fifth uh, uh, Sukta. Uh, sixth stanza so their existence is only in this uh, this uh, this this single line inside the rigveda uh, of course and then etymo you can understand the etymology of these three rivers of the, like a white colored river or uh, the river that having lot of banks or uh, the river moving far, all the, that kind of etymology so there is nothing more uh, we have to discuss about these rivers and of course yesterday i mentioned about the rasa so Uh, all that uh, one particular event that happened, that, of course, that is not not related to Shwetia or Susharthu or Tripsama, is it's only uh, related to the Rasa River. Is about the Sarama Pani incident that is happening. In, that is, uh, the Sarama is uh, the dog of uh, Indra and Pani are the trader community, and there was some interaction happened. So I mentioned and discussed it yesterday. But it is not related to the tributaries, but it is related to the river itself, Sindhu itself. That is the Rasa River itself. But of course, when this kind of trans Himalayan uh, trade network, uh, uh, so uh, like uh, it will, for example, this is a trade uh, like a branch of the trade network, trade path which is passing through the Sama. And even historical period, this kind of a path existed along the Sama River, that is a shock river, because it is flow flowing like this and like this, like it goes like this. So uh, it, this the Sama River is actually an access point towards China. Uh, just like your uh, Upa River is accessing Afghanistan, uh, so similarly the Tratsama River, uh, the Shyok River flows like this in Z, like a, the letter Z, the Z, you know, it goes directly up to here, it goes further here into the Chinese territory. So Tratsama is a, uh, like a river that gives access to China. And of course, naturally, the trade routes, the Silk Route and uh, the precursors of the Silk Route Another Chinese trade routes, etc., uh, like uh, pass through this uh, the Sama River and then finally pass through the Sindhu River and and reach into the Sindhus Valley region. And so that there was some kind of uh, very light way, very uh, kind of uh, not very substantial, but some exchange of trade goods happened between uh, Chinese civilization and uh, Indus Valley civilization. That uh, is not no. It's not from Rigveda, but from archaeological uh, findings, we found uh, you now there is exchanges, some material that is uh, some uh, vessels or materials that is created in uh, part of Chinese civilization is found in Indus Valley civilization, and some material and uh, artifacts from Indus Valley is found in Chinese civilization. So they have some kind of uh, trade relationships, and that is trade relationship is what. Uh, somehow indirectly reflected in this Saramat Pani uh, Sukta that is in the, again in the tenth mandala. So that ha that kind of events happen along these rivers, uh, primarily along the Sindhu River itself, the Rasa River itself. But of course, uh, Tatsama might have played a big role into it. Even Shushartu can also give an access to Chinese territory because they, when you when you go like this, it can reach the Chinese territory. Even uh, Shwetiavari also know it's one of the tributary of Shwetiavari. Uh, this Vedya river goes up this northwards and reaches the Central Asian or Chinese territory. But another, otherwise, evolution point of view, or like migration point of view, because uh, we have when we typically say the that the migration from uh, this Vara Prithvi 
for the northwestern india to uh, iran and europe but there was two type of migrations basically one is the westward migration wherein they, they travel along the kufar river or the kabul river and go to afghanistan and then it goes uh, finally to iran and the uh, turkey greece uh, or europe etc another is a northward migration so whatever my uh, you know, whatever i have mentioned in my book is that these northern rivers of northern tributaries of sindhu might have played a big role uh, in the migration of people to the northern side and center to central asia etc and there are indeed some tribes like shakas uh, shaka and uh, uh, tushara that is tukhara the tukhara is in sanskrit in sanskrit literature like in mahabharata and ramayana they, they are called tusharas tushara itself means uh, snow and that uh, the current the origin the current name by which the the tribe is known as a tukhara tribe the tukharas and then shakas uh, even push in the historical period the kushans all these have their ancestry along this northern uh, tributaries of the sindhu river like swetia and the shushartu utrasama etc punas for example boons uh, so they are all having their uh, ancient native territory along these rivers uh, but they are not in history as chinese uh, civil chinese kind of tribes the hoons uh, they are all in this region uh, along the swetia river and uh, like that so these northern tributaries of the sindhu also give rise to so many clans like shakas and hoons and uh, tusharas etc and they were also like uh, interacted like see they typically what the situation is that they migrated from here to the northern regions etc and then they came back as invaders so it is something like uh, it's completely different from a european invasion or uh, because they are very much native to the region but they migrated from here to the north and west and then came back as came back to india and uh, ruled in uh, ruled india the kushans are one of the biggest examples the kushan uh, kushan dynasty itself their ancient people were living in this region to the north of the sindhu and then they migrated to china and uh, and then as a chinese civilization they came back and again uh, ruled uh, kashmir for example kashmir and some parts of punjab so uh, what kind of what we call what kind of relationship we can give to them because they are semi native to bharata so they are ancient their ancient ancestors had some connection with the bharata or at least on the north northern uh shores of sindhu river and its northern tributaries and then they migrated uh, northwards or eastwards or westwards and they pro prospered in that region and then they came back as rulers and ruled uh, some regions of india so it's a kind of very strange relationship but if you look at uh even the indo-european speaking people also they migrated to the europe at a very ancient period much more ancient than the shakas or hoonas uh, or tusharas and they became uh, at least at the language of the, the indo-european language uh, become pro the, they became stronger or they prospered in europe and then they came back as british or uh, uh, french or portuguese kind of people of course they have no memory of uh, uh, being uh, their ancestors being in the same territory but only they got surprised uh, because of the language similarity whatever language they were speaking the english or germanic or everything has some connection with sanskrit and that is how the study of indo-european language also started how how come that they, these people were in europe and then there is a language in india the sanskrit language and they all look similar and that is what they started studying all this stuff and of course later they politicized it and then instead of accepting that their ancestors migrated from uh, the north the northwestern india uh, it, it was very difficult for them to digest so they <laughs> simply thought of okay it's maybe the other way around their ancestors might have come to india uh, and then that is the reason why we have some from here etc psychological problem actually that's only i could say so uh, that that is in other words i mean they should if they because uh, it's not very difficult for them to accept that the hunas or the 
the shakas uh, or the tucharas that is tukharas were having a very uh, uh, like close by ancestry like ancestry very close to india that they have they have no difficulty to recognize so it is a larger version of the same kind of problem uh, or same kind of phenomena that is for the indo european people they were at a very much more ancient period they were living in the northwestern they means their ancestors were living in the northwestern territories of india and then before, uh, all they forgot about all these things they migrated to central asia or to uh, iran and from there they migrated to europe eastern europe and then uh, finally to western europe and england everywhere and then now they are looking back and seeing the language similarity with the sanskritam here so it's a very strange situation so anyway that debate is still active and going on and but now almost 90% the gravity is uh, because with all this evidence that we are also positioning giving through the rigveda both uh, srikanta lagiri and uh, whatever contribution i am doing so we have now full clarity of what what really happened uh, that uh, the migrations are having a, at least a language migration not if not people have some kind of uh, clarity that we have that there is a origin is in the northwestern indian india and then it's all spread over a lot all the way up to europe so that's about this uh, three rivers and today we will also cover a few more rivers uh, uh this yeah so now uh, again these are also uh, tributaries or tributary tributary of your sin in this it's about all part of the river network of sindhu river so uh, of course uh, like uh, the and the remaining river is one is suvastu river suvastu suvastu river is on then there is a gauri river and then shwetayavari uh, shwetayavari i just repeated again because uh, it is same as shwetya river so just because the Shweta, the river name shwetayavari uh, and shwetya both are uh, the same river so i don't talk much about the shwetayavari here then last river is the ashmanvadi ashmanvadi river so these are the three more rivers that we will discuss today uh, so maybe i first of all i will tell about the geography of uh, these rivers so suvastu is not a uh, it's a it's, it's not a very unfamiliar river uh, it is one of the largest tributary of the kupa river so kupa river is flowing like this is the kupa river so it is flowing from the uh, afghanistan mountains and flow through gandhara or gandharva which are used them used and join sindhu here and this green color is the charasadda valley which is a land which is a mountain locked valley like kashmir valley so kashmir valley is inside india but uh, charasadda valley is inside pakistan and both have same kind of characteristics the entire valley is uh, bounded by mountains uh, so of course the some of the names like mujawat mountain mujawat this is a name exactly recorded in rigveda for this mountain so the northern mountains of uh, this uh, gandha this uh, Charasadda Valley or the Gandharva territory or Gandhara, Gandhara territory is a Mojavat mountain also is mentioned. So this uh, Suvastu river uh, flows like this. It is a tributary of the uh, Kupa river and it joins uh, Kupa in, the, in this Gandharva territory, the Gandharva or Gandhara territory. And this name, current name I think will be more familiar to you. It is the Swat river. When we say Swat, I think most of the people will understand Swat Valley, Swat. I mean, this is a more, more sometimes even in the found in the news newspapers also, because this entire area in the northwestern Pakistan, uh, there are a lot of conflicts uh, with the Taliban and all these things. So Afghanistan, con Afghanistan in Pakistan conflicts, uh, all these things happen in the Swat Valley. Sometimes some terrorist attack, everything happened. Unfortunate that this ancient very land is uh, now very conflicts on. But Swat Valley is otherwise uh, occasionally found in the news, news newspapers. So that, that is the Swat River. And Swat River is known in the Rigveda as Suvastu. Even Swat is a short form of Suvastu, basically. So, and Suvastu means the best place to live. It was a kind of a, maybe a good place, uh, peaceful place in the Rigvedic period. Uh, something like Kashmir before the insurgency. So, the the name means uh, the is a very positive and very beautiful name suvastu means uh, uh, a river which is uh, uh, livable that is the meaning of it a uh, great river so that's uh, suvastu river is currently known as swat river 
So that is one of our rivers which we want to discuss. And of course, Svetia or Svetia where we already discussed. And Gauri is a tributary of the Suvastu River. So of course, you can see it's a multiple river uh, relationship. So Gauri is a tributary of Swat River, which is a tributary of Kubha River, which is a tributary of Sindhu River. So you have a large, very big river relationship here. And Gauri is known as Panchkora now. Today it is known as Panchkora. So uh, this, uh, of course, Gauri means, if people may be asking anything to related to goddess, uh, Shiva's consort, or Parvati, or uh, Gauri is a synonym of Parvati, right? So, uh, in fact, one of one of the people who uh, who purchased my book has asked me, is Gauri related to Shiva or uh, is this place, this is the place of Bhagavan Shivaji. Uh, see, the, the thing is, the Gauri basically means white color. Th that is similar to Suvastu, right? Because this is a mountainous region, so snow-covered region. So the most, 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 most part of this river is a snow-covered, uh, like the river valley, everything will be snow-covered. So it will be whitish in color. That is why the name Gauri is... Uh, uh, here. 